finish up uh, what we were talking about last week. If you remember, uh, last week was Parshas Achare Kedoshim. It was a double Parsha. And Parshas Achare Mos, uh, the first part of the Parsha, uh, deals with the Yom Kippur service. And in fact, in addition to being the Parsha Sashavua, it is the Kriya Satora of Yom Kippur morning. And there's a special trup for Yom Kippur, Yom Narayim generally, uh, that, that we use. And uh, the reason I was talking about Nadav and is because the beginning, the, the Yom Kippur service is introduced, after the two children of Aaron died, Hashem then says to uh, Aaron, or to Moshe, to tell Aaron, he says, uh, do not enter the Holy of Holies unless you do certain avodas. So based on the question I began with is, why is the Yom Kippur service introduced with a reference to the deaths of the two sons of Aaron? Right? It says, Achare Mo, Shnei Bnei Aaron, Lo Yavo El So the answer is, this is, you know, I should have said it last week, the answer is a very logical connection. Because Nadav and Aviyah were people whose desire to attach themselves to Hashem was so strong that they didn't want boundaries, they didn't want constrictions, they didn't want limitations. They wanted a relationship to Hashem that was not circumscribed by details. The tragedy of their death underscores the idea that indeed you can only approach HaKadosh Baruch Hu based on the permission that He grants you. So now it's very logical. In other words, Hashem is saying, in effect, look at what happened to Nadav and Aviyu, who wanted to approach holiness without any type of limitation, and see what happened to them, and therefore, al yavo b'chaleis No Jew, even the Kohen Gadol, cannot assume he could enter the Holy of Holies whenever he wants. Rather, there's a certain procedure that has to be, has to be followed. And by and large, those of you that Yom Kippur night, or even not on Yom Kippur night, learn the Mishnayis of Yuma, and of course it's a good thing to do, and uh, the Yom Kippur Musaf itself, goes through, step by step by step, the Yom Kippur service. In fact, this is the part of the Yom Kippur davening uh, that Talmudei Chachamim enjoy the most and Balabatim enjoy the least. Uh, Rav Soloveitchik, who is brisker, uh, obviously briskers love Kutchim. Kutchim is the main thing they learn. So when it comes to the Yom Kippur davening and they look at all the different ways the Aved is described, it becomes a huge machlokas because they could say, oh, the Python is following the Rambam Shita here, but the Svartic Python is following Tosvah. So they kind of analyze, actually probably in reverse, they're, they're analyzing different Nekudot and they really pay so careful attention to every little detail because they connect the poetic rendition of the service in the Musaf, which is poetry, they connect it to the halachic background, Bavli, Yerushalmi, Tosefta, Tosvos, Rambam, Ramban, and they love to trace it. That's why there are whole books, the whole Svarim, that kind of match the machsor to the halachic sources. So for Tamerei Chachamim, this is by far uh, the most enjoyable part of Yom Kippur, but for people who are not well-versed in the details of the Avodah, it's very boring. They just don't get it. So Rav Soloveitchik writes, when he came from Europe, and he was davening the first time in Boston, uh, he just noticed that uh, the president and, and uh, would just have like, during the Seder Avoda, he would just have uh, conversations with people. Like it was a way of just a time out where for him, this had, for Rav Salvechik, this had been the highlight of the Avoda. Uh, but be it as it may, uh, you can learn the Avoda in many different sources. You can get it from the Chumash and Rashi. You can get it from the Mishnah in Yuma and you can get it from the Yom Kippur Machser. And more or less, the accounts are the same, although there are some details in each source that do not appear in the other source. But here is something that's very, very, very striking. You go through the Psukim of Achare Mos, and it talks about the incense, and it talks about the goats, and it talks about entering the Holy of Holies, and it goes through all the Aveda. And in our minds, we automatically assume that it's talking about Yom Kippur, Holy of Holies. But you know, the funny thing is, this is always the case, our mind has certain preconceptions, so we literally think we're reading it in the Chumash. If you look at the Chumash, you will see 
Yom Kippur is not mentioned until the end of the Parsha. It says, when Aaron wants to go to the Kodesh Akdashim, he must do A, B, C, D, E, F, A to Z. doesn't say Yom Kippur. At the end it says, and this shall be a chukas olam, and this shall be an eternal law on the 10th of Tishrei, which is Yom Kippur, so shall it be done. But you'll notice it doesn't mention it until the end of the Yom Kippur Aveda. So because of this, there's a tremendous chiddush that is said in the name of the Gra, and this is brought down by the Gra's Mechutan, the Chayayadam, right? I'm sure all of you have heard of the Sefer Chayayadam. Chayayadam was the uh, equivalent of the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch that was popular in Lithuania. Now, there are basically two books that uh, fill the role of Kitzur Shulchan Aruch. One is the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch, and one is the Chayayadam. Both of them are abridgments. Uh, the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch was written by Rav Shlomo Gansrit, who was in Hungary. And the Chayayadam was written by Avram Danzig, who was in Vilna. And the Chayadam is a bit of a harder book. Uh, the Kitzer is easier, maybe that's why the Kitzer became more popular. On the other hand, because of the Kitzer's Hungarian orientation on certain matters, not so much in davening, uh, that, that's fine, but Gabi Hilchos Nida, the Gabi sexual matters in particular, the uh, Kitzer Shulchan Aruch is extremely machmer, actually, uh, etc. But be it as it may, uh, in Hungary, uh, the Kitzer Shulchan Aruch was the major source of halacha. Both of them are 19th century, and uh, in Lithuania, the Chayyadam. Now, the Chayyadam, his name was Avram Danzig, and he actually wrote two for him. See, the Kitzer, uh, maybe that was the genius of the Kitzer. The Kitzer is technically an abridgment of all four Chalakim of Shulchan Aruch, although the bulk of it is Arachayim. But the Kitzer also has Kashras, Yoridea, and a, a little bit of Evanaz, or not too much because that's really for Rabbanim, a little bit of business halacha, Choshen Mishpat. So the Kitzer is literally a one volume abridgment of the whole Shulchan Aruch. The Chaye Adam is only an abridgment of Aruch Chaim, and the Chaye Adam wrote a separate Sefer on Yoridea, which is called the Chachmas Adam. Right? So obviously the Chaye Adam is not as, uh, is not as brief as the Kitzer Shulchan Aruch. But the Chai Yodam was the Vilna Gaon's Mechutin, interestingly enough. Uh, that means their children married each other. I don't know if it's son-daughter, daughter-son, which way it was. And uh, so the Chai Yodam is uh, actually a source for teachings of the Vilna Gaon. And the Chai Yodam brings, at the end of the Chochma Sodom, I believe, this idea that the Gra was Mechadesh, that for the 40 years in the desert, when Aaron was Kohen Gadol, he could enter the Kodesh HaKadoshim any single day of the year as long as he followed the Yom Kippur ritual. As long as he brought the goats and as long as he brought the incense and as long as he brought the bull. And that's how the Chumash is worded. Aaron can only go into the Kodesh HaKadoshim if he does A to Z. But Aaron is not limited to Yom Kippur. When it comes to chukas olam, the eternal permanent law, then this procedure can only be employed on Yom Kippur. Again, look at the psukim. Again, it's so surprising because we're so used to assuming we're reading about the Yom Kippur service that we don't even realize that Yom Kippur is not mentioned in connection with Aaron. Yom Kippur is mentioned only in connection with chukas olam. And uh, you see from here that in a sense, that actually means that the 40 years of the Jewish people being in the desert was like one long Yom Kippur. That was the spiritual madrega. Now, that doesn't mean they were fasting. Obviously, they weren't fasting. They were eating man. Uh, but the sense of closeness to Hashem, the sense of being surrounded with the clouds of glory, that impressed on every single day a certain level of the holiness of Yom Kippur so that Aaron could be nichnas. Now, did Aaron take advantage of that privilege? I honestly don't know. We have no record of how many times, if any, Aaron went into the Kodesh HaKadoshim when it was not Yom Kippur. But the Gra understands that at least theoretically, Aaron would have been able to, to do so. 
Right? In other words, Bezais Yava, Bezais, with this, Aaron can come in. Now, there's an interesting little word. This is a bit of a drush. Uh, and again, going back to Yom Kippur a little bit. Uh, you know, uh, one of the most moving poetic piyutim compositions that we recite uh, on both on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is the piyut that uh, begins in Nisane Tokef. That we are proclaiming the holiness of the day and we talk about Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur as days of judgment and who will live and who will die and even the angels in heaven are quaking and shaking with trepidation. And there's a whole story, the Or Zerua, one of the great uh, German Rishinim, brings the famous story of Rav Amnon, where Rav Amnon was uh, a rabbi in uh, Germany, and uh, the archbishop was trying to convert him to Christianity. And he kept on bothering Rav Amnon, why don't you let me talk you into this? And Rav Amnon at one point just wanted to get him off his back and said, listen, uh, give me three days and then we can talk about it because he, he figured he would get a three-day break from, from this constant harassment. But as soon as Rav Amnon said that, he had a very, very, very deep sense of regret because he was kind of implying that I'm thinking about it and give me three days. So he actually asked Hashem, so to speak, to punish him that he should lose his tongue, that uh, dare to say such words, he should lose his hands. In other words, he, and basically he didn't show up at the third day, and the archbishop had all of these um, mutilations occurring to him. And as Rav Amnon was dying, this is the Orzerua story, he was asked to be brought to the shul before his death. And right before the chazan was going to say Kedusha, Rav Amnon recited this prayer. And then he died. And three days later, he appeared, he was dead, he appeared to his Talmidim in a dream. And he taught them the exact words so they would remember what it was. And that is the Orzerua's version of how Nisan Tokef got into the liturgy. Historians, both from and non from, debate whether this story actually happened because there is no record of a Rav Amnon in Germany. There literally is nothing else we know about him. So that's a very interesting story in and of itself. Is this a true story? Was this an inspirational story? Was Rav Amnon a model of the Jews who gave their lives al Kiddush Hashem during the Crusades? Because Rav Amnon is dated during the Crusades. Big, big, interesting machlokas. But this is the story the, uh, that Rav Amnon brings. So the very end, see, in the Machsha, you don't always know because it breaks up into paragraphs. In other words, if I were to ask you, where does Nisan Tokef end? We know where it begins. Where does it end? Well, I mean, Davidin keeps on going, right? So it's hard to know where, when does the composition actually end. But the end of the composition is that uh, there's a paragraph, Adam Yesodome Yafor. Man is like dirt. He comes from dirt. He goes back to dirt. He is like a dream. He is like a piece of broken pottery. He is like a dream that vanishes. But you, Hashem, live for eternity. And then we say at the end that in spite of our hopelessness and our fragility, Utshuva, Utfila, Utstaka, Mavirin Esroa Hagesera, that repentance and prayer and charity can take away the evil decree. So it ends with a note of hope, meaning. Yeah, we're in pretty bad shape. It's pretty scary. But shuva tfilu tzdaka mavirin es roa So that's part of Nisana Tokev. That is part of Nisana Tokev. In and of itself, Rav Amnon's composition. So what's interesting is, if you look at any machsar, you will see above the words, shuva tfilu tzdaka, are usually in very big type. Shuva tfilu tzdaka. But above the words, is printed in small font, three apparent synonyms, which are kind of odd. Above tshuva, there's a little word that we don't say, we don't say, that says tsom. Tshuva is expressed by fasting. Above tfila, it says kol, your voice. And above staka, it says mamon, that means money. Tsom, kol, mamon are small words that are printed above tshuva tfilut 
We don't say those words. Now, it's a very odd thing. I mean, Shuvat Shvilat Staka might be difficult to do, but they're not difficult to translate, meaning we don't really need, I mean, they're much harder words in the Machler than Shuvat Shvilat Staka. We don't really need a translation of those words. Like, what's the point of those translations? And they're not even exact translations. They're kind of synonyms and, and the like. So there's a famous word. I don't know who says it, but it's a really makes, it makes a lot of sense. That what it wants to do is it wants to turn these three words into three synonyms, each of which has the same gematria. Okay, tshuva. Tshuva becomes tsom. Tsom is fasting. What's the gematria of tsom? Sadik vav is 96 and 40. So 96 and 40 is what? Uh, 136, right? 136. Tefillah becomes kol. What is kol? Kuf vav lamid, 136. Tzedakah becomes mamon, which is again, mem mem is 80 and then 86. And a final nun is 136. So tshuva, tzvi, lutzaka have different gematrias, but when you convert them to kol, tsom, and mamon, each one is 136. Now, okay, that's interesting. Why is that significant? So let's add up 136 times 3. In other words, what is the total gematria of tshuva, tzvi, lutzaka when you convert it to kol, tsom, and mamon? So 136 times 3 is uh, 18, 10, is 408. Okay, 408 is the combined gematria of Kol, Som, and Maman. Okay, why is that important? So some say this is a remez to the Kriya Satayra of Yom Kippur. It says, with Zos, Bizos, Yavo Aharon El HaKodesh. Now, the simple meaning is, with the following service, Aaron shall enter the Holy of Holies. But let's look at the gematria of Zos. Zos is 408. Zion, Ayan, Tuf. What is the key to entering into a holy relationship with Hashem? Fulfilling Zos. Zos is 408. And that is Kol, Tzom, Mamon which is tshuva, tfila, utstaka. That the real relationship to Hashem comes from tshuva, tfila, utstaka. Uh, <laughs> you know, it would take quite a genius to figure that out from the machzer, but, but again, uh, whoever figured it out is a really tremendous pshat, that that's why we, we convert tshuva, tfila, utstaka into the gematria of 136 times 3, to be marames, that on Yom Kippur, you want to become close to God, you want to enter the spiritual Koli of Holies, you enter it by Tshuva Tzvila and Staka. Yeah. How does the Rav think that the word Torah is not mentioned in the past? Yeah, it, it is very interesting that uh, Tshuva Tzvila Staka does not mention Lima Torah. Now we know from many, many Mamari Chazal that not only is Talmud Torah the greatest of the mitzvahs, which of course it is, but Talmud Torah is also Machaper on Averos? Uh, it's, a, it's, a good, it's a good question. Uh, but apparently, uh, although on Yom Kippur you should learn also, but on Yom Kippur we, we, want, we want to push you in the other direction, meaning uh, don't say on Yom Kippur, oh, I'm not going to be Isaac and dominating that much. I want to, want to learn more. Although, as I said before, the Seder Avaita itself can introduce a great deal of Talmud Torah into the Yom Kippur, into the Yom Kippur Avaita. In fact, that's all an interesting question. How much, uh, how much learning should you bring into tefillah? You know, I, I saw an interesting observation once by Rav Volba. I think it might even be in the Ali Shur. You know, there are many, many, many commentaries on, on tefillah. No, you know, up in the Siddur, Otsarat Tefillah says a wonderful thing. Two volumes with many, many commentaries. And there are modern commentaries, and even from the Rishayim. But Rav Volba said there's a certain, and on one hand, this is tremendous because you understand the davening so much better. But he said there's a little bit of a deficit sometimes in over-intellectualizing davening. 
Because when you're over-intellectualizing, so you're davening and you say, oh, Hashem, your kindness and your chesed is so great. Right? So then you start thinking, all right, like, like learning Gemara. So what's the difference between kindness and chesed? So Rashi says this, and Tosa says this, and Rambam says this, and according to the pshat, uh, that chesed is this, and it's connected to that. Revolva said, you know, maybe that's not what davening is about. Davening is not necessarily about a highly intellectualized, analytical approach to things. It's about feeling connected to God. So, does it really make a big difference if I know the difference between tova and chesed on the davening level? So Revolva actually suggested that sometimes Mephorshim might even be a, it's a big chiddish, interesting chiddish, might be a, even a bit, bit of a disadvantage in the emotion of tefillah because it then turns into like your davening shmon esrei the way you would learn a Gemara. What's the difference here? And this are, you know, why does it say this when it says that? You, you know, and that's not really, that kind of interferes. It's like a static that interferes with your relationship to Hashem. So that, that's a point to think about a little bit. Um, okay, uh, but be it as it may, this is the idea of um, Tshuva Tzvilut Staka gets converted to Kol Tzom Mamon, and that's the Gematria of Zos, and the real way we enter Kedusha is by Tshuva Tzvilut Staka. Yeah. Oh, okay. So if you look at the repetition of the Amida mm -hmm. uh, for the Musaf of the two days of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, so the Chazar is the Shatz of Musaf, is Tshuva Tfilut Staka. It's the end of Nisan Tokef, Mavirin Es Roa Hagezeira. Uh, you see how important Nisan Tokef is because uh, it is the only prayer that appears both days of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. I mean, most of the time we have a different... I, 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 mean, no, I mean, obviously the fixed Amida is fixed, but I'm talking about the Piyutim. Normally you have different poems for each day of Rosh Hashanah and on Yom Kippur. Uh, the only one that is constant, uh, two days of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, is in fact Nisan Tokev. That's how important that was, uh, that was considered. Okay. Alrighty. Um, now, uh, one other ha'ara about, again, I'm, I know I'm a little behind, but one other about the Yom Kippur Avaida is worthwhile. Uh, the Yom Kippur Avaida has many, many details. I'm not going to go into details now. Maybe maybe we'll talk about it uh, closer to uh, Yom Kippur. Uh, but we have uh, many, many rituals that have to be done. Uh, but one of the interesting rituals is the Kohen Gadol is supposed to take two goats. These are called Si'irim. And the goats are supposed to be identical. They're supposed to look the same, same height. They should have been purchased at the same time, same color. Two identical goats. And then he draws lots, right? He has a basket in which there are two pieces of wood covered in gold. One says, Lashem, that's Hashem's name, a, a, a sacrifice for God. And the other says, La Zazel, to the well, difficult to translate, but literally to the demons. And the Kohen Gadol doesn't look at which one he's picking, but he picks up the two uh, lots and he puts them on the two goats. So one goat gets designated as the goat for God and one goat gets designated as the goat for Azazel. And the goat that goes for God is indeed shechted and its blood is brought into the Holy of Holies and it's sprinkled next to the ark, and uh, it is eventually uh, burnt on the, uh, well, it's not burnt on the altar, well, the fats are burnt on the altar, and the meat is burnt outside, etc., uh, and the like. That's the goat of Hashem. What happens to the goat of Azazel? It goes for a walk. Uh, someone takes the goat uh, all the way out to the desert and knocks the goat, throws the goat over uh, the mountain, Pretty hard to throw a goat over. It's, it's a much harder job than you might think. You know, a goat is not a willing participant in this. But eventually the goat uh, dies, and uh, that is called the Soir La Azazel. But before that goat is sent, the Kohen Gadol actually confesses. He puts his hands on that goat, and he confesses all of the sins of the Jewish people. That's the term scapegoat. 
And it's as if that animal absorbs all of the sins. And when the animal dies, even though it's a number of miles from the Beis HaMikdash, a great miracle happens that the red thread in, that was hung, hanging in the Beis HaMikdash turned white in a good year, in a good year, to show that Hashem has forgiven our sins. So, it's interesting that the Torah calls this goat the goat to Azazel, which literally means the goat to the demons that inhabit desolate desert areas, a goat to Azazel. Chazal were very uncomfortable with that Lashon because if you read it literally, that could actually mean, God forbid, we're bringing sacrifices to the demons. So because of this, the Mishnaic term for that goat is different, the rabbinic term for the goat is different than the Torah's term for the goat. The Torah calls it so'ir la'azazel. The Mishnah calls it so'ir hamishtaleach, which is a much more neutral term. That just means the goat that is sent out. And although I did not see the particular reason for that change, but I would suggest that that is the reason for the change, that so'ir la'azazel sounds really strange, and people would misunderstand it. Of course, uh, one of the things that uh, is nice about Israel is that even the profanity is sometimes based on Torah sources. You know, if somebody tells you, Lech Lazazel, that means, you know, go to hell. That's why I'm pushing somebody off. But it's so, so beautiful that that comes from the Sa'ir Lazazel, right? So the person may not know it, uh, but even the secular Israeli will use expressions that come from the uh, from the Torah. Okay, but changing the name does not obscure the difficulty of what's going on. What on earth is going on with Sa'ir Lazazel? What does it really represent? And is it a korban? Well, it's not really a korban. Korbanos are brought in the base of Mikdash. This is not brought in the base of Mikdash. This is brought into the desert and thrown over a cliff. So the Ramban says right off the bat, that Sawyer and Mishtaleach is one of the great, great mysteries of the Torah. And there's no way we can really understand it. But he does suggest one interesting idea that the Sawyer and Mishtaleach is called a shochad. It is a bribe to the Satan, to the Satan, to the powers of evil. It's a bribe. And the mushal that he gives is the following. This is still going to be very difficult. I'll just give you the mushal. He says that often, if you want to approach the palace of the king, the palace of the king may be surrounded by vicious dogs, vicious attack dogs. So you not, might not be able to come in. So if you're smart, and indeed uh, burglars do this all the time, you carry on your person some raw meat, you throw it to the dogs, the dogs get attracted to the meat, they leave you alone. Now a well-trained attack dog actually doesn't get distracted in that way. But the average dog, you know, will go for the meat and leave you alone for a while. So too, the Ramban brings, again from Kabbalah, that on Yom Kippur, the day that we want to approach Hashem and be so close to Hashem, there are many, many powers of negativity and evil that are trying to block our way. So we give a, and that's called Azazel, the demons, so we give something to them the same way you would throw raw meat to a, an attack dog to get the attack dog off your back so we are able to then approach the king on Yom Kippur. This is the mashal the Ramban gives for the so'ir hamishtalech. But you understand that at the end of the day, you still have a problem here. So what are we doing? We're bringing a korban or something to the powers of evil so they shouldn't attack us. Still, that's about a Zara too, bringing something to the powers of evil. So Rev Dessler tries to offer what you might call a psychological explanation 
to a mystical idea. In fact, um, one of Reb, I mean, Reb Dessler was an enormously uh, great, uh, great person, uh, but part of his greatness was he was able to translate. Now, he was, you know, he, he knew Kabbalah, he knew Musser, he knew all, all the realms of Jewish thoughts, philosophy. Uh, but instead of looking at them as separate bodies of wisdom, he would be able to translate them. He could take a Kabbalistic thought and say what it means in Musser, what it means in philosophy, what it means in Hasidus, and he would actually show that fundamentally there's a common truth that underlies different ways of expression. That's a very, very unusual talent to be able to penetrate, because Kabbalah has such a complicated vocabulary. Just to master the vocabulary is extremely difficult. But to then take the fundamental spiritual idea behind it in a way that you could... The Ramchal was the same way, by the way. Now, these people don't realize. Mesila Shesharim, unlike, let's say, Derech Hashem or Das Tavunos, is uh, not written with any Kabbalistic language whatsoever. There is no Kabbalah explicitly in the Mesila Shesharim. In fact, the Ramchal wrote Mesila Shesharim at a time when he was under a ban of excommunication not to teach Kabbalah. Which means we have to be grateful. Had he not been under a ban, he would have continued his Kabbalistic work, which none of us understand. Uh, he was in Cherem to teach Kabbalah, so he had to write Mesila Shesharim and, and the like. But the Ramchal gets the last laugh because although Mesila Shesharim is totally non-Kabbalistic, it is 100% Kabbalistic. Every line in Mesila Shesharim is based on the Zohar and the Ariz Kabbalah. And in fact, there are Sfarim now, there are versions of Mesila Shesharim that try to show you the Kabbalistic roots of Mesila Shesharim. So the Ramchal was able to take, extract from Kabbalah the spiritual truths that could be expressed in non-Kabbalistic language. That's not an e that is absolutely not an easy thing to do. Rev Dessler uh, was very, very similar. And he says, Behind the Ramban's Kabbalistic idea of shochad l'satan, a bribe to the satan, is a very powerful psychological idea. You know, there's a mitzvah in the Torah, which the Ramban himself counts. It's so interesting that this fits the Ramban elsewhere. And I don't even know if Rav Dessler brings this. That there's a mitzvah, a very strange mitzvah. When you wage war against a city, you know, a Canaanite city, you have to leave them an avenue of escape. You can only surround them on three sides. You cannot surround them on a fourth side. They have to be able to escape. Now that's counterintuitive, one would think, if you're trying to conquer a city or destroy an enemy, why give them an escape? So one of the reasons is because if people don't have an escape, their ferocity may be so awesome because they have nothing to lose, that they may be much, much more dangerous. If they have an escape, it'll be easier for you to conquer the city because a lot of people will just try to get out of there. Because when people have no choice, that's when they'll do anything. So Rav Dessler says, the Yetzir Hara, and some people would differ with this, uh, the Yetzir Hara is the same way. When you give the Yetzir Hara no out, no choice, no concession, it will fight against you with extraordinary ferocity and drag you down. Let's imagine you decide today that you're no longer going to speak Lashon Hara. No matter what. And you make a decision, I will never speak Lashon Hara again. That, that sounds great. That sounds really, really good. But says Rav Dessler, the moment you make such a declaration, you will have a tremendous urge. Like you say, I mean, never? The next five years? The next 10 years? 20 years? 30 years? 40 years? Amir Tzashem, Admeya V'yesra. Hi, that's pretty hard. Maybe I'll start tomorrow. You see? Because psychologically what happens is when you don't give the Yetzirah any concession, it's going to attack you. So Rav Dessler says, what you have to do is you have to play games. Now these are games, but these are games that work. You have to basically say, well, listen, I can't say I'm never going to speak Lashon Hara again, 
But I can say I'm not going to do it till 1 o'clock. Yeah, 1 o'clock is a half an hour. In other words, I'm conceding to the Yetzirah, right? But then when 1 o'clock comes, you say, well, you know, I'm doing pretty good. So Rav Dessler says that is in Musr what the phrase shochad l'satan is. Shochad l'satan is you make a concession to the power of evil so it does not fight with the same ferocity that it would if you were not giving it any avenue of escape. You see, Rav Dessler, he's taking this mystical idea and he's putting it into personality development, in tshuva, in how you improve yourself, and the like. So therefore, that's the lesson that you sometimes have to be modest in your goal, in which you acknowledge that you're going to be making mistakes, but you still have progress within that parameter, as opposed to the notion of total obliteration. Now again, uh, some will argue with that derech of Abayda, and in certain uh, Sifri Chassidus, they talk about this sudden break. You know, you got to make this sudden break. You got to burn your bridges. You can't be connected to anything evil, or it's going to drag you down. But Rav Dessler is suggesting that you need a certain amount of moderation and concession, and this is what lay, behi lay behind the mystery of what is called a shochat l'satan. Okay, I have a few, again, I'm sorry I'm falling behind, but I have a few more comments about this Aramish Taleach. I'll, I'll, I'll mention them in Mr. Shem tomorrow. Have a good, uh, good day. Yeah. Yeah.